Today, I'm really honored to be joined by Matthew Barzin, who is the former American ambassador to the United Kingdom from 2013 to 2017, former ambassador to Sweden from 2009 to 2011, and a former executive uh, at CNET. Matthew is also the author of this new great book, which is titled The Power of, the power of Giving Away Power, uh, which is what we'll be discussing along with his career uh, today. So thank you very much for joining me, Matthew. Justin, thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. I was going to wear, normally when I talk to the Churchill crowd, I, I put on a, a certainly a suit and tie or at least uh, a jacket and shirt. But as I explained to Justin, our house in Kentucky, which is where I'm dialing in from, got hit by lightning. We lost the internet and all uh, air conditioning. So apologies <laughs> for being uh, a little informal here. Matthew, no, uh, excuse me, ambassador, please. No, oh, no, is, come on, Matthew, a... Matthew. <laughs> This is not a formal state function, so I appreciate, I appreciate those words. Um, and I will say uh, for, our, for our attendees, um, we'll put a link in the chat for, for you to purchase Math, Matthew's book. So uh, Matthew, I really wanna get started. Um, I, I love that the book features Churchill heavily. I, it was a really great surprise for me, but I do have an insider question for you. Uh, and if this is a state secret, please let us know and that you can't answer it. And the question is, is Joe Kennedy's replica of the Oval Office still in the American Embassy in the UK? Okay, great insider question. The, so uh, Ambassador mm -hmm. Joe Kennedy, um, as Justin alluded to, um, he was many things, humble was not one of them. And uh, so he built a replica of the Home Office. FDR was paranoid that he wanted to come back, they were both Democrats, and run against him in, in one of Roosevelt's elections. So the rumor was that they sort of, he sort of shipped him off to London so he wouldn't run against him. And then he builds the replica of the Oval Office just to allay all of FDR's fears. But seriously, the actual building is no longer the US Embassy, and it wasn't even the one that I was in before we moved to the new one. It was um, the Canadians. And they did, re it was right across Grosvenor Square from where the old US Embassy was. And they called and it's like, hey, would you, because they were demolishing everything, we were leaving. It's like, do you want it? And, and the official answer was, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> if, 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 I don't, if anyone out there knows where this, where this replica uh, offices, please do write us in and we'll, we'll send Matthew over across the pond to find it and, and retrieve it for us. Um, so what I really love for, for the attendees who, who are on this call, and thank you again for those who joined, um, if they don't know a little bit about your background, can you please tell us a little bit? And then for those who have read the book, you'll pick up in the book that Matthew weaves his, his career and his, his experience through the way that he understands and the application of his theory of leadership and, and giving away power. So a little bit about your background, please, Matthew. Sure. I, I think it's, uh, I was joking with my wife uh, the other day that it's, um, it's strange that I use the word power twice in the title of my first book. And it was a word that I studiously avoided ever using when I was a diplomat, when I was in politics as Obama's campaign finance chair, when I was early days of internet.com stuff. And it, because for me, and I don't know if other people feel this way, I just had a problem with that word power. And I think lots of us do, because it's so often associated with sort of lording it over others or hoarding it to yourself and these sort of unhealthy patterns we get into around power. Um, but in the course of writing this book and, and learning from these, and I hope we'll have a chance to get into this, leaders, now leaders like Churchill, who are so well known, but I think, and I know we'll get into this, aspects of what I think made him a really wonderful leader that aren't so often appreciated. Um, and then some leaders who most of us have never heard of, who didn't shy away from power. They just thought about it really differently than we do. Um, and basically, yeah, don't hoard it, don't lord it. But even more radically, they said, don't even share it, which sounds, we love to say power sharing these days for good reasons, but they're like, no, no, no. If you share power, you're fundamentally dividing it up. And what they realized and what I've come to learn slowly is their way of thinking about it, which is power isn't a scarce resource that you mine, you know, M-I-N-E. It is something that you make and you make it with other people in small groups over and over again. And it all begins with giving it away so that you get it back it again, so you can give it away again. And to ask you about um, your discussion in the book regarding 
this mindset. And I would say applicable theory. Can you tell, describe Mary Parker Follett's this mindset of creating power with mm. and not over? Kind of what? Can you go a little bit more sure. detail on why she was the the well, uh, poster child? She was, and, and talk about. I mean, Churchill is a household name. I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure with this great group, we're going to have someone who has actually heard of Mary Parker Follett. I certainly hadn't. Most people haven't. But I bet you have heard of Peter Drucker, right? Probably the most quoted leadership guru of the 20th century. Um, and Harvard Business School did this uh, about 20 years ago, did this big survey. They asked 200 business gurus around the world, hey, who is your guru? So number one on the gurus, gurus list was Peter Drucker. That was the end of it. Except Peter Drucker, right towards the end of his own life, admits in this beautiful essay that he had a guru all along. The guru's guru's guru. And her name is Mary Parker Follett, 1868 to 1933, born in Quincy, Mass, right outside of Boston. And she was in her day, so she's writing, call it 100 years ago, writing about at a time when America is coming out of a global pandemic, uh, America is struggling with um, fear about big business, fear of government regulation of that big business, basically social, political, and economic division everywhere she saw. And... Um, and all of those issues, like they do now, felt really big, right? I mean, they just feel like intractable, kind of overwhelming on a bad day. And they did to her too, but she had this beautiful insight, which I'll share and what I think you're referring to, Justin, which is like, okay, the, the problems are big, but we can start dealing with them. And her great insight was in really small, practical, tactical ways. Now, by this point in her career, she'd spent 25 years on the front lines of not only social work, um, working with newly arrived immigrant families in Roxbury and places around Boston. But also she said yes to every single civic subcommittee that the people of Boston could throw at her, like minimum wage ones, et cetera. So she had a PhD in meetings and she knows like Kat does and you do and everyone on the call, just how dreadful they can be. And she also knew that they could be not dreadful. They could be where magic happens. And so what she said is there are four possible uh, outcomes of any meeting we have, but only one of them is worthwhile. And I'll quickly tick through the three bad ones and the one good one. Bad outcome number one, uh, you try to win the meeting. She's like, that's no good. Why did you even invite anyone else if you're just trying to carry an idea forward that you had before that meeting? Number two, the flip of it, just acquiesce. You know, Kat or Justin, you all seem fired up. Let's just, you do it. It's like, no, that's no good. Why are you at the meeting? right? You're denying them a unique perspective, namely your own. Okay, so number three bad outcome, and this is the hard part, because this is one that I think certainly I was taught to, to look for, which is compromise. But Mary Follett says, you know what? Sounds good, but really compromise is just little mini victories and little mini acquiescences added all up. Best case, you leave that meeting with a little bit of a victory, but you don't leave with anything more than that. So she said, the only reason we should ever get around a table is for co-creation, to actually make something today, make something together. And what happens, and think about a good meeting we've all been in, this is where she thought the magic was, which is you, you, you came into that meeting with your truth or whatever we, you know, like with your ideas and thoughts and feelings, um, you contributed them with others. And at the end, you've built this thing together. It might just be a decision. It might be a mission statement. It, might, you know, it doesn't really matter. It might be physical, it might not be. You are in that thing that you made together. It is forever part of you, but you haven't sacrificed or given up your identity in the process. In fact, you and everyone there leaves equally enhanced. And I just find that because I get overwhelmed by all this big stuff we're dealing with. And that's just sort of like, well, I can do that. So I've tried to do that. I think these other leaders that I talk about in the book, maybe instinctively, or maybe they learned it like I did, also try to conduct themselves like that. And may I ask with, so for those who didn't hear the introduction, and, and again, I encourage everyone to continue sending in questions. Um, before you were a diplomat, you were a, what we would now call a, 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 tech, a, a, a tech entrepreneur but you probably didn't call yourself that back in the 90s. So what you just described, uh, Mary Follett's way of, of, of achieving some sort of, of shared experience and positivity, were you actively experiencing that? Or were you, at, when, were you experiencing that at CNET 
and were you actively saying this is exactly what I want to happen, or did this did this understanding of yours come, you know, through the years? Oh, certainly the understanding came way later. I never could have articulated that. And even it, so, reading Mary Follett, I just like the light bulbs. Uh, or the connections just started to all kind of fire. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's what's happening. Now it was kind of easier early nineties because nobody knew what they were doing. And so that's kind of liberating, right? So no one came in in those early days being like, I know the answer, let me win this meeting. It's like, we were all clueless. We were all kind of snot nosed 20 year old, you know, 20 mm -hmm. somethings. So that was probably helpful. Um, but what's interesting, so we, we did start to feel that kind of magic. Uh, but then once we became cool, we went public, we had, you know, on paper anyway, lots of wealth and people all of a sudden, no one thought it was cool when we went to go do this, then it became cool. And the minute it became cool, it became very uncool. You um, know, and in terms not fun. Of, yeah. In terms of um, bringing something to the table, you quote in your book, which I love this Churchill quote. Churchill said, quote, charity towards each other's shortcomings. How does that mindset of his play into uh, your understanding of this type of, of, of shared power? Well, I love that you love that one too, because I don't know about, if, if you asked people on, on this uh, webinar, this Zoom, to just sketch, if I say the word Churchill, like what is the drawing you would draw, right? And I, in my old job as ambassador in London, I, there was this sort of annoying and misleading news story that would come out at, at least once a year about President Obama having removed the Churchill bust from the Oval Office. It was so annoying. And it's like, he had one always outside his personal office on the, in the residence and et cetera, et cetera. But like, whatever, it hit a nerve with people and the true story would never come out. So I'd have to spend a lot of time talking about it. And in the process, I found myself saying, well, why are we talking about Churchill's bust, right? It's like cast in stone. It has no arms. It's just such a weird image for thinking about Churchill, like a disembodied head. And yes, he was smart. But I think the interesting part of him wasn't him standing as a disembodied bust or even him standing on a plinth by himself with a walking stick. Like that's not the image I have of him. It's him and then, you know, down the road from our old embassy, is FDR and Churchill sitting in that famous statue on a park bench with room for you as a tourist or whoever to sit down in between them. And that was my favorite image because this man understood relationships and the power of relationships. Um, that you said is so important because the recognition of imperfection and the charity and giving people the benefit of the, of the doubt is exactly how friendships form in the first place and how they stay healthy. And so often we hold friendships to the opposite standard. And, and uh, like, like for instance, the phrase that I must have said a thousand times or more as ambassador, and you'll hear it a lot in the next week, probably at the G7, right? Um, and it's always said with this particular tone of voice, <clears throat> which I'll try to emulate, which is like often wrong, never in doubt, and it's like, there is no daylight between the US and the UK as it relates to, and then, you know, fill in the topic. And so it's like, what a ludicrous standard of agreement. Of course there's daylight, right? I mean, think of a US of course, yeah. uh, and UK uh, soldiers, uh, you know, bravely standing shoulder to shoulder in battle. There's daylight between them. Think about Ambassador Wynant, one of my heroes uh, and predecessors, dancing with Churchill at Checkers when they realized the US would finally join the war effort. There's, space, there's daylight between them. Um, when there is always daylight in a friendship and we shouldn't be scared of the daylight. And your book goes into this special relationship and, and you tell a, you know many great stories of how you experienced this special relationship as ambassador. Uh, for those who have yet, not yet read the book, can you talk about Churchill's trip to Fulton, Missouri, his Sanusov's peace speech, and what you what your conclusion is from there regarding not just one special yeah. relationship, but the numerous special relationships that he advocates for. Totally, and and it's um, so this group knows the scene, so I don't have to set it right. He's been he's been uh, the the British voters have voted his party out of power. He's sort of licking his wounds. It's 1946, and he has a stack of 
um, correspondence, inviting him to do lots of other things and well-wishers. Um, and he's basically saying no to every request he gets. He's like, who wants to hear from a has-been? But one of the little notes sticks out in the pile and it's handwritten um, and it's inviting him to Fulton, Missouri. And it's, uh, it's from President Truman. He's like, oh. And there's this lovely little added gesture, which I don't know if it made any difference. I like to think it did, which is, hey, I'll meet you basically at the train station, or you know, I'll, I'll meet you and we can take the train to Fulton together from Washington. So it's kind of this nice gesture. It's like, oh, okay, and I'll introduce you. So he did, and he gives that famous speech. And this group knows, and you mentioned the name of the speech, but no one calls it the sinews of peach speech. They all call it the Iron Curtain speech, because that's a- Yeah, of course. It wasn't coined that day, but, but it was made pretty famous that day as a powerful phrase to, uh, describe this consolidated monolithic power that Stalin was building across uh, Europe. And so what I love about the speech in that moment, he said, like, okay, so he is now, he's got the world watching. I mean, it wasn't just Missouri, right? It was the whole US and there's global press there. And he knows this. So he has this opportunity again, out of official power, but still having this other kind of power. People want to listen to what he says. So what are we going to do? back what we called the West. What are we going to do in the face of this monolithic power? And he did not summon us to form consolidated power of our own, right? He asked us, this is where he coined special relationship. And it didn't just mean between number 10 and 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, although that was certainly part of it. It was between official Washington, but between farmers and mothers and fathers and just millions of special relationships across the Atlantic. Um, and what he knew was that so much strength and power were in those sinews of peace. There were lots of them. They were flexible. They were um, not all of one type. And he saw the power in that. So uniting free peoples together through those democratic bonds, it, it, that would form the sinews of peace. That's how we stand up to this bully not by being bullies ourselves. And I don't think we can be re-reminded of that too often. And throughout the book, you, you, it's an it's, it's a evolutionary discussion of what you call the constellation of, uh, of power. And, and it seems like you use Churchill's speech and his, and his um, really uh, advocacy to, to build these special relationships. That is one great example of that constellation, we have a, a, a question here that says, um, are there any leaders or companies today um, who are making the shift from this pyramid mindset to the constellation mindset? And is that a, is that a, um, a conscious decision that, you, that you've seen in, you know, in your, your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the two, if you look back historically, the two that, that have, that everyone has in their wallet or so to speak, you know, in their, on their person somewhere or nearby um, is uh, your phone, right? And if you get in a dispute at a dinner table, a disagreement on something factual, we all say, oh, we'll Google it, right? But you think about it, you're not really Googling it, you're really Wikipediaing it because you know, if some obscure blog pops up at the top, that will not settle the argument at the table. You need something definitive that like, no, 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 this really happened in 1969 or whatever. It's like, oh, okay. So Wikipedia usually is the first answer. Wikipedia is this remarkable story and I won't go deep into it now, but it started, first of all, Jimmy Wales and his team uh, back 20 years ago took on the richest company in the world. I mean, who remembers Microsoft and Carta? But Microsoft, richest company in the world, took on the oldest, one of the oldest companies in the world, Encyclopedia Britannica. It was a big business. They fought each other for it. Harvard Business School wrote a case study about how Microsoft won. You know, and then like six months later, Wikipedia changes the world. But the people at Wikipedia, and you'll see this in the book, the longer version, they started out to build a site called Newpedia. Um, and then they had this realization and they opened up and started acting more like a constellation, less like a pyramid. And, you know, Microsoft has lots of smart people. Um, they were unbelievably digital, but they were just a digital pyramid. And we'll get into this, I hope later, because I'm using these phrases like pyramid and constellation, and I'm mindful that I haven't really and I, explained and those symbols. That's yeah. my fault for not, for yeah. not allowing you to explain that. Um, and, you know, I think this is a great time for you to do so. And then maybe we can come back to well, examples love, of 
love feedback from this group because it's um so it, it's let me try to summarize it really quickly um the other thing you have uh nearby actually probably we don't anymore but a dollar bill so a us one dollar bill um back in 1776 july 4th philadelphia two declarations were made that day the famous one declaring independence the less famous one is uh, the declaration familiar to startups everywhere. We need a logo for this new country, right? It took longer to design the logo than it did to win the war. And I'm saying logo, which is a little, you know, glib. It was the great seal <laughs> yes, of the United States, seal. but I mean, it's yeah. a logo, right? And now early on, they figured out, and they put the A team on it. I mean, they put Franklin, Adams and, and Jefferson had just written these words of the Declaration of Independence. They put them on the design committee, total failure. We don't have time to get into that. But anyway, it would have a front and a back. They settled on a design for the back, which is that pyramid with the little funny all seeing eye pyramid on top of it. And for the front, they figured out this American Eagle and the shield and, and the motto, right? The motto was actually an early contribution um, from Adams and, and Franklin, um, which was e pluribus unum from many one. But there was a formula for these things back then. And they needed what they called a crest. And the crest was supposed to be the overall essence of the whole thing. So the war was won and they finally figure out on 13, as 13 asymmetrical stars with beams of light rating at eight behind it. And they called it the radiant constellation. Now, we see it, it's on the front of your US passport. It's above the eagle's head on the dollar bill on our great seal. You just sort of, I think if you're anything like me, you just sort of look through it. And we've made it more orderly over time. It doesn't look how they really designed it. And the asymmetry is, is important because what they realized and why this was the essence of the essence was, look, any band of revolutionaries can declare independence. The hard work was interdependence. How are these big states and little states gonna figure out? And I wanna give a big hypocrisy warning. I mean, clearly this is this great idea and a great symbol and obviously this country in the 200 plus years has fallen well short of what I'm about to say. We all know that. But it was and is a great idea, which is how can these states deal with each other and be at once um, part of something bigger but still distinct, right? How do you have unity without uniformity? How do you have the best of diversity without division? This is what's occupying their minds. And the symbol of a constellation does that because at any scale, you and your community, states within each other, even the United States in the community of nations that they had just joined. That is a way of thinking about yourself and those around you that is distinct. You're a star, I'm a star. And we can choose to make connections between us to make something more useful, more powerful than we ever could alone. So that is the constellation. And final thought on this, George Washington gets to name the first five Navy frigates when he gets uh, fast forwarding a little bit. Right, And he is not like super creative about what he's gonna name these things. The USS United States, the USS Congress, the USS Constitution, the USS President, and you guessed it, the USS Constellation. So that's how sort of central and tangible that symbol was for interdependence. And I, and I argue in the book, admittedly oversimplifying, that they put the pyramid, that symbol of consolidated power, that world of top down and actually the world of bottom up also, at the back, that's where it belongs. In times of war, sure, you can go to that, that might be effective, but it should be at the back and we keep putting that at the front of our lives. And if I can ask you to expand on the pyramid and, and there's, a, there's a question here from Richard Eason who's, who says, I was a junior officer at the embassy in London in the late eighties. What was your biggest challenge serving there during your time? And I think it's a great question and, and you explore in your book that restriction of the pyramid and can you and can you talk a little bit how a bit excuse me I have an 11 month old daughter it's the words sometimes disappear can you talk a little bit about how what the pyramid is and your personal experience with overcoming or, or trying to challenge the pyramid uh sure I, the, the question from the person who was a junior officer uh in the 80s I think you said it was um so in answer to that, so I went back before I went over, I had this whole hot summer in DC trying to get approved by the Senate. So I went to the State Department and read all the old, and I'll forget the lingo, uh, he may remember it. We did these like mission strategic plans once a year and they saved them all, of course. So I went back 
and read them all, I think dating back to, to your time, sir, when you were there. And they, would, they changed a bunch as you'd expect, but, but the common phrase that I think was in every single year was this idea of pillars, like pillars of the special relationship, right? And sometimes there were three and sometimes there were five, but there were always pillars. And I would doodle as I was reading these things. And I thought pillars all by themselves, which is what these sort of State Department language often is, like pillars all by themselves are things people put in their gardens to remind them of ancient Greece and Rome, right? They're kind of like relics. Like pillars exist to do something, right? They're supposed to hold up a roof. And the only way they can hold up a roof is if they have a firm foundation. So if you stick with me on that thing, and I weirdly on the other side of the screen have a replica of these pillars because I made a little wooden, I didn't make, I asked someone to make me a little kids but building block set with pillars, foundations, and roofs because we talk so much in government about the what, the what, the what, the what, the pillar stuff. And I was like, well, the why, to, to take Simon Sinek's wonderful start with why, like the why is this roof. That's why we have these pillars to you know do whatever. But when I got there, um, the Pew Research uh, folks had done a survey of 40 countries, basically asking young people, people under 25, what do you think of the US? Like thumbs up, thumbs in, thumbs down. 39 countries, young people had a much higher opinion of America than their parents and grandparents, except for one country, the United Kingdom, where young people were far less than their parents and grandparents. And so basic math would tell you, uh-oh, right? Because that crowd doesn't really remember Churchill and FDR and Wynett, right? They don't remember lots of the things that this group holds dear, whether we were around to experience them or weren't. So I thought, okay, well, let's go engage with that group, which uh, we did. And the one thing I knew I didn't want to do is give them a lecture on US foreign policy, right? Just because they're young people. I have three teenagers. I know they don't want to hear one from me. I bet strangers don't either. So instead, I went in the end to 200 schools. I did this workshop with 20,000 British 18 year olds and got them to fill out a card like this and just draw a picture of something that frustrated them about America. And we would talk about what frustrates and confuses them about America. And we'd have a really good, honest conversation. I think Churchill would have been proud of acknowledging each other's shortcomings and misunderstandings and talking about them openly in a spirit of friendship. And I'll say, uh, um, I smiled wide during reading that passage about your discussion of uh, being a hunter and, and how Hunting is, is for many Americans, a, a, a pastime passed down from generations and how the Second Amendment provides for that. And I just found that to be so incredibly endearing of really getting down to the fine details of, you know, diversity in, in whatever one conceives. Um, mm -hmm. so, so I just want to say that was, a, that was a, I really enjoyed that part of the book. Oh, I'm so glad. It, it, uh... Good, any other I, well, oh, there was part two question. of your question, which I think yeah. I did not answer, but. Well, let's, uh, there are so many questions here, Matthew, uh, regarding your experience as ambassador um, for, to both uh, Sweden and the United Kingdom. Um, you know, there's a question here that says, and this is a broad question and, and you went through it. So maybe you can give us the, the very unique perspective, you know, of your perspective of Brexit. But what will Brexit do to the special relationship? And does it, and if it does indeed still exist is the question. Yeah, it was called into question, I think this week. Um, it was declared dead six days after I arrived in the UK on the front page of the Sun, the number one circulation newspaper in the whole country. And this was because the Cameron had recalled parliament, if you remember, to vote on the authorization of use of force in Syria. We were having a similar debate back here. Um, and they didn't support Cameron's idea. And so the front page above the fold, death notice, you know, beloved offspring of FDR and Winston Churchill, dead, age 67, blah, blah. It was funny. Funeral to be held at the French embassy. So like it was, it was a serious joke. And uh and so I sort of looked into it and it's like, you know, every so often they just declare it dead. Usually because to the earlier point, there is daylight between the US and the UK on some issue. And it's just happening right now in advance of this G7 trip. Um, and so this British friend of mine who lives in New York wrote me when that came out and when that front, he's like, um, 
you know, well done, Matthew, you've killed it in less, it was seven decades in the making and you've killed it in less than seven days. I was like, oh, good, good British humor. <laughs> uh, but he said, no, seriously, don't bang on about it. It's a cliche. So he's a smart guy. And it is a cliche in the sense that if you say a room of a hundred people, 50 of them roll their eyes, like they'll hear, oh, please stop, like my friend. And then the other 50 like sort of earnestly nod their heads right away. But eye rolling and head nodding tell you something. No thinking is going on, right? They either totally hate it, totally love it. And so I started to have fun with like, well, okay, let's, let's tease this apart. Um, and so I won't do the full version here, but I'll try to, if you can see there, you know, these little like two by two diagrams, you know, divide the world into of a course. quadrant. Okay. And the good answer is usually the upper right-hand corner, right? So picture special relationship in the upper right-hand corner and you sort of like, well, what's the opposite of special? Let's call it routine. What's the opposite of relationship? Let's say transaction. So relationships are about people, transactions are about things. So if you contrast special relationships, which has lost a lot of its energy and meaning, and I say this as my wife's a therapist and we do couples therapy. So like, let's unpack it. The opposite of a special relationship is a routine transaction. And I think aided and abetted by a lot of amazing technology, we have all gotten really good at turning a lot of our world, especially frustrating friction, like routine relationships and special transactions, which are kind of a grind, just, we just automate them, right? But, but which is totally understandable, automate, replicate, automate, replicate, but there is a cost, I think, and a catch to doing that. And what Churchill can teach us is okay, you've avoided some unpleasant friction by automating everything. Like I could wish everyone I've ever met a happy birthday on social media without any effort. It's just a little simple script, right? But it also like we've all received those automated yeah. messages. It doesn't count for anything. You right? hear from that person once a year and it's on your birthday on yeah, your face. And it's like, it, you can just feel the, with all the warmth and that we associate with algorithms. And that's just a fancy word. Like it's not even, it's just like a little equation. It's automated. And so what we lose in that quadrant of routine transactions, no energy lives there. So what Churchill tells us, I think, is to fight the instinct to only automate and replicate, go to the Northeast on this little graph and humanize and empathize and seek out fruitful friction, right? That's what friendship is all about. And what he knew is the reason, we sometimes mistake it. You'll see this again in the next seven days for sure. We get tricked into thinking that countries like the US and the UK do hard things together because they're friends. It's like, yeah, yeah, but really they're friends because they did hard things together, right? So if you do, and if I sat down with you and I said, hey, let's be friends and we'd never met, I almost guarantee you we wouldn't be friends. Like, it's just not how friendships work. They emerge, they are a byproduct of hard, difficult, meaningful work. So. That's what we need to throw ourselves back into. Um, that has what has led to and fuels the special relationship. So if it's feeling a little um, sagging and lacking energy, I have an idea. What if we really put our heads and hearts and minds together and figure out how to vaccinate the globe? Because that has the fierce urgency of now. It is a medical challenge, a logistical challenge, a financial challenge, an ethical challenge, like, wow. And the US and the UK are pretty good at those things. And none of us has the answer separately. So let's put our heads together with the rest of the G7. We could do this. That could pass the Mary Follett test, I think. And I would also argue that, or not argue, but highlight um, in your experience, which you again touch on in the book, is when you were ambassador of Sweden and you realized that taking an American truck up and down the country and making pancakes Although, you know, apparently it was fraught with some, with some obstacles, humanizes a relationship. And do you feel that you, were, you accomplished what you were trying to accomplish of humanizing a relationship via, via uh, efforts like that? Totally. I mean, I, I don't know the, I'm going to date myself here. I'm hoping we have a bunch of people my age or older, but I mean, Justin, you're too young, but the Boston Pops, does that mean anything to you, Justin? The Boston Pops. Uh, no comment, but the answer is- okay. So he doesn't know, that's a no, but I grew up in Boston, but, but I'm a, very quick. So 
Boston Pops, hugely popular. And there's this legendary guy, Arthur Fiedler, who when I grew up in Boston, I mean, they had, he was the guy. And you would, normal people would think that he must have been the first head of the Boston Pops, right? Because he's so famous, he's synonymous with it. But I did a little digging right around it when I got to Sweden and I'll, I'll make sure this connects. Um, you'll tell me if it connects, but it connects for me. Um, so Arthur Fiedler, it turns out was like the 19th head of the Boston Pops because they had cycled through 18 of them in about 18 years because no one liked the job. But the idea of the Boston Pops before Arthur Fiedler was to do different kind of programming to basically make people who didn't feel comfortable with the price or with the atmosphere of uh, uh, the orchestra, the normal orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra. They didn't, they were intimidated by it. So let's be like less uptight and make people feel welcome. So it's like an inclusion. I mean, you know, done in a good spirit of inclusion and it just freaking failed. Like no one ever came. Along comes Arthur Fiedler and he says, I think this building is just fundamentally intimidating. I don't care if you make the price one penny and you rejigger the tables and do them in circles, people don't feel welcome here. So you know what? I'm gonna go out and bring music to people, to the banks of the Charles River where people do feel welcome. Why? Because I see them there every weekend. So he turns and he's like the third violinist or something like that. He's not like the top guy. So he's like, who's with me? And like eight people go, right? Like eight people are like, yeah. And a bunch of people, and I said eight go and then 12 go. And then it becomes, and something like I'm fast forwarding over the next two decades, they made something like $50 million in those dollars, which then gave money back to the Boston Symphony Orchestra, which lets them redo the whole concert hall. So it was like a both and kind of happy story. The reason I tell it is that I would say to my team in Sweden, I was like, look, if you want to come on this truck trip with an Airstream trailer, cook pancakes, be sort of cheesily American open, by all means, do it. It's like playing music on the banks. But you know what? The first violinist of the Boston Symphony Orchestra never went alone. And that didn't mean that he or she's job playing traditional violin in a traditional building was bad. Absolutely not. You can do both. Or you could do one or the other. So a great question here from Ewan in London. And again, about your perspective from your career, the ambassador has uh, been, you know, to Sweden and the UK. He asks, how do you, uh, you, EU nations see Churchill and his legacy, especially his Atlanticism while supporting great European cooperation? And this is, as you know, with, I'm sure you know well, during the Brexit campaign, Churchill was quoted on both sides. Yes, yes. So yeah, how, from your perspective, how, how is his, how is, what's his legacy seen as? I mean, so I read both sides of that debate and I'm not enough of a Churchill expert to weigh in on, you know, where does that sort of, where does the ledger on either side um, come out? What, what I loved back to the sinews of peace speech is he, and he got sort of dorky and geeky in the speech, right? He refers back to that ancient, um, I mean, ancient, it was like 1380 something treaty between Portugal and England. And what I thought was so sweet, he's like, that still counts. So every sinew, every connection still counts in that worldview. You are so low that if you look at the world like a constellation, which is my language, not his, but, but I'm attributing it to him, seeing these sinews, seeing these connections, What's really interesting about a constellation as a metaphor, right? If I look, if I show you Orion's belt and you've never seen it, like your, your young children, Justin, it's like, it's not at all self-evident, but once you're shown it, you can't unsee it. You always see a belt, but there's no line there. It's just three stars, right? So you have to kind of pass it on. You have to remind people like, oh, there's the line and the line is useful and we don't use them for navigation much anymore but imagine you really did like these are patterns you have to be told to see them and they can be really helpful and that's what I think Churchill would see about this current debate it's like these connections matter don't factor them out factor them in and you know I, I'm gonna ask a, a great question and, and and pause my thought there so the question here is who does the ambassador yourself, of course, who do you look to as a great leader who has um, practiced what you've, what you've preached here with giving away their power successfully? Uh, Barack Obama on the campaign for sure was a wonderful role model to me about that. Um, 
and and so he's one. Uh, Mary Parker Follett, the Guru's Guru's Guru, was an amazing um, one, um, especially in the world of, of civic work. And I'm here in Louisville, Kentucky. Our city's going through a struggle like many cities in America are. What a great leader she is. And then someone who's amazing, who's also, you know, sort of in your phone, in your wallet, in your pocketbook. Um, how many people here have heard of D. Hawk? Right, D. Hawk created the largest commercial organization the world has ever seen, which is what we now call Visa, right? Which is like oh, yes, yeah, yeah. trillion transactions a year, something crazy. But he got, and I don't have time to get into it, but basically the credit card system was in the late 60s, early 70s, um, a free for all, and it was really breaking. It was like four week back jam but consumers were getting exploited, um, not to say they haven't since, but, but it was really just fundamentally not working. So he's at a, he's a mid-tier manager. He's an amazing story. Mid, mid, a middle-aged guy at a mid-tier job at a mid-sized city in Washington state, right? And he somehow gets called in. Bank of America pull, pulls in all its affiliates. It is a classic pyramid, right? Top down. That's how banking worked. And it's broken and they somehow, he, he has energy, you know, when you're in a meeting and you express an opinion and all of a sudden you're chair of it. So he finds himself as chair of like, how do we fix this broken system? So he locks himself into a hotel room with 12 other, I think, smart people who are at the front lines of this thing. And long story short, they come up with this system where every bank, regardless of size or how much money they have, is going to participate equally in this system where you compete and cooperate. It's both. It's not one or the other. And he has the job of going to the CEO of Bank of America, huge bank now, huge bank then, and saying, you are going to give up all the statutory power you have over all of us as your affiliates. You're going to give it up and you're going to join this new system as a total equal with no more power, even though you're worth 100 times more than we are. And he convinced them to take that leap of faith. And that, I think, is an inspiring um, for-profit story along with Wikipedia. And then the other one I would say is the story of Alcoholics Anonymous. Yes. And how, and uh, which is in the book and, and, and there are other really full, wonderful histories of it. You, you can read this does it, you know, just a short amount, but the idea that you can only heal yourself through and by healing others. That's the story of how um, the two co-founders um, mm -hmm. did it. And then the internet itself. There's a wonderful story about Vince Cerf, who's this amazing guy who co-invented the internet. And he describes it he came to London and spoke with our with our team and with all these young activists who were really concerned back then. I mean, this is Edward Snowden time, right? So then and now people concerned about privacy, surveillance, all this stuff. Um, and halfway through the session, he kind of stops the, he's like, look, all these questions are great. He said, you talk about the internet like it's um, one big monolithic thing. He isn't, he's like, it's not, it's millions of things. And he's like, it's not even things. And then he kind of wistfully goes off on a tangent and he says, you know, the internet used to be a verb and I'm sitting there and so I'm like, oh, this is so good. Like, where's this going? He's like, it's not a thing, it's a verb. He's like, we used to say in the early days, he would reach out to a new university, right? When it was part of DARPA and he'd say, would you like to internet work with me? And he said, it was like asking someone to dance. And I just thought that was so beautiful. And so some people said yes. And then he made a funny joke. He's like, I asked France if they wanted to dance and they said, no. Right? They had a right to participate. They weren't bound to participate. They decided not to because they had what they thought was a better system called Minitel. Turns out it wasn't in the end, but they were free to say no. Others were free to say yes, like the UK. And so that's a long-winded answer to, yeah. uh, to that question. So we have just about 10 minutes left and I, and I quite a few good questions in here. Um, one question is, um, tell us about being a tech, uh, being a retired tech person. Um, the comment in the book about the queen, what she said to you when you when you were presented to her at oh, court. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, could you tell a story about okay. the iPhones? So now I say this mindful of, turns out, and I learned this the hard way. Others have learned this the hard way too, but you were never, ever, ever supposed to reveal mm -hmm. the contents of a private conversation with Her Majesty the Queen to anyone, but I did. So I've already screwed up once. So I'm not, I, there's double, no double jeopardy. So like, I'll do it again. And the reason I'm doing it again is that 
it was misquoted. So I said I, it was misquoted and, and no one would care. Like who cares what the American ambassador said six years ago, except that it is reprinted in every single story about uh, Prince Harry and Meghan, about the Sussexes, or and every oh. time they have a royal wedding. So, and here's, so it's misattributed as the queen told the American ambassador that she doesn't like selfies. That is the not true thing that gets sort of, like I somehow spilled the beans on that. That is not what happened. So I want to say what did happen because it's to me the exact opposite story. So I go in and it's, uh, as an American, it's very odd. You, you get in a you know, morning coat, you put on a top hat, you get in a horse-drawn carriage, my wife, Brooke and I, you go to Buckingham Palace from Grosvenor Square in a horse-drawn carriage. I mean, that's cool, it's weird. They stop traffic, you go in, it's lovely. And you come into Buckingham Palace and it's like throngs of tourists, not for me or my wife, it's just, they're always there, right? So you come in, then you go and you take off your top hat mercifully, and then you go have your, what they call the audience with the queen. And so we do that and it's all kind of going fine. And she's so good at this. She's done it forever and she makes you feel at ease. And she knew about my internet background. So she's asking me about that kind of stuff. So I, uh, so I said to her, I said, well, what's it like having all every single day when you come in and when you leave, just having all these people snap pictures at you? And she said, well, she said, they've always snapped pictures. Um, but in the old days, and she said, they used to take the cameras up, snap them and let them hang around um, their neck. But she said these days, and she had this white glove in her hand and she holds it up in front of her face as she's talking to me like I am now. And she goes, but now they put them up and they never take them down. I miss seeing their eyes. And I just thought that is so sweet. We think of this as this one way, like the tourist snapping the picture, she's being snapped, there's no connection there. And at least from her perspective, it was a connection and she missed it. And I thought that was such a sort of lament for our times about mm -hmm. how all these routine transactions and the lack of connection and the lack of energy that lives there, bring it full yeah. circle to Churchill. And th these- Yeah, the, the routine, you're right, the routine. What from a tourist perspective, may be a uniqueness of seeing the queen, but the routine act of, you know, they may have the queen, they may have the president, they may have, everyone that they videotaped ever on their phone, thus it becomes routine. Yeah, and then, but you know, and cutting yourself off, think, no, I don't matter. Like my eyes don't matter. Like, why would you think they matter? Unless you're yeah. told they matter. And now that you're told they matter, I think how sweet. So the fact that it was misinterpreted as she doesn't allow selfies, I was like, no, she's, which, which I think is read if you're an American, it's like, oh, she's snobby and, and thinks it's beneath her or something. And her whole point was like, I want the connection, not stay away. Well, Matthew, you have entered the um, the very uh, revered um, arena of being misquoted. You know, Churchill's there. Oh, you got yeah, Churchill. Right, right. You yeah. got yourself. You, you got many. We're other often people. listed together. Often, yeah, just right next yeah. to each other. <laughs> you know, not alphabetically, so, but a great question. This is from Eric Larson. Um, he says, in the model you were you discuss in your book, how important is, is it to involve people who disagree with you, even rivals? Lincoln famously did this. Churchill was known for his ability to verbally eviscerate his rivals as opposed, as opposed to incorporate. However, I, I would argue that although he, Churchill was very able to, to um, correctly put some, something wrong, he himself really brought in other points of view. Um, yeah. um, and, and maybe that's, so I would argue that, but, but great question from Eric about what, how, how it important is. is it for other points of view? So I think Eric has hit on and I, I've gotten a version of that. And um, I'll give you two flavors of Eric's question and, and then the answer that I wish I had given. And so now I'll try it out with Eric and see if, if this ring resonates with you all. So um, a couple weeks back, I was on Noah Feldman's podcast, who's a wonderfully wildly smart person. And so he says, yeah, yeah, okay. I get it in theory, Matthew, this whole co-creation of blah, blah, blah. But he's like, oh, really? Like your Senator Mitch McConnell, because he's I'm from Kentucky, you know, and Joe Biden are really going to get together and co-create like Mary Follett wants. And then this morning on Morning Joe, I get from that wonderful team, a basic like at, at the global level, like, are you going to go co-create with Putin? Like, tell me how that's going to go, right? So they're both really good versions of Eric's question, as is Eric's. And so I didn't have great answers for those two at the time, but but reflecting on it, I, what, I, what I think is that is hard to imagine. Like I can't, I don't have a good answer on Putin or on McConnell and, and Biden, but 
I want to take it one step kind of closer. So if we're talking domestic US politics, like what if Democrats um, just whatever the policy topic is, where people from Treasury and state and the, and the, the you know, the uh, West Wing, when they're in a meeting together, same team in quotes, what if they dealt with their differences and their rivalries uh, constructively, like Mary Follett would want us to? Now, that doesn't seem too much to ask, but what anyone from Washington knows is some of the worst knife fighting is intra-party, right? The worst rivalries and the nastiest things said behind people's back or to people's faces is on the same side. So forget blues getting along with reds. What if just blues or reds within their own groups started practicing the kind of habits of interdependence that we need. That doesn't, or on the global context, what if the US and the UK and other members who are democracies, who tend to see eye to eye, embrace their own differences with each other, stop this daylight between us BS, acknowledge the differences because the whole thing with the constellation mindset is you do not want uniformity. You do not want one giant star, you want diversity and distance and difference because all energy lives in difference. So when we say these platitudes, what unites us is greater than what divides us. Often that's just an excuse for sweeping uncomfortable differences under the rug. That, that does not help the healing. You need to deal with them and work through them together. That's when friendship and understanding and trust and respect starts to emerge. So that, that's what I would say to Eric. Wonderful. Uh, just last two questions here mindful of time. Um, Susan Vincent, you know, we have a lot of Anglophiles in this group, as you're unsurprised to hear. She, she just would love to know what were your highlights for when you were the ambassador to UK, putting in the big caveat that you experienced Brexit um, in, the, in the, two, uh, the 2016 election, of course, at the end. And then there was one big other thing that, Scotland. Uh, that and Scotland, the, the referendum. So what were, but what were your highlights of, of, as ambassador? Uh, I think highlights for me, the, 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 these uh, 200 sessions with 20,000 British 18 year olds were the most energizing. And I remember at, after like the fourth one or something, this one ju wonderful junior person on the team who did all the work to set them up was sort of like, sir, are, you know, are we done yet? And I was like, oh, what do you mean? And he's like, well, they're always the same. And I said, well, yes, in the sense that it's always guns, racism and police brutality on the frustration side, it's the same that way. But like, these are different people. I'm different every time. Do you know what I mean? I learn something new every time. No, no, we're never stopping. We're going to do two of these a week until I leave. So that was a huge highlight. I am not at all musical, except I love music. And we were able to, at the American Taxpayer House, which is Winfield House, this amazing place, host these big uh, Independence Day parties, so Fourth of July parties, which ambassadors do all around the world. Um, we have a particularly beautiful and big place to do it. So we had thousands of people. We pretended it was like Glastonbury, the great British yeah. uh, music festival. So we sort of unsubtly tried to imitate that. And we had Duran Duran and Squeeze and Bastille and all these cool acts. We had Ed Sheeran come and play, The National. Um, so wonderful bands. That was a highlight. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. too many to list, you know, I'm a diplomat, sure. but those are two. And if I can ask, um, what was that? So the flip side of the card, I believe you also asked them to write down what the positive, you know, what positive thoughts these students had. What were, what were some of the, some of the most common? Well, so on the British side, um, and, I, and I say the British side, because I continued this thing back in America. That's I'll right. That. Yeah. I'll close with that, which I think is, is relevant for this group who cares so much about uh, the, both sides of the Atlantic. Um, so the British kids, 20,000 cards, there isn't a single winner like there was, or winner, it's a terrible word, a single dominant word like there was on the confusion negative side. Positive side was like food, diversity, opportunity, sports. So kind of a, a mixture of those things. I kept it going when I got back here to Kentucky and across the river in Indiana and uh, not at the scale. And I had no reason to do it. I just couldn't stop because it's so interesting every time you do it. So here's what I learned from these American kids. Their number one frustration with their own country is uh, division, economic, racial, political. So divisions are number one fear followed closely by loneliness. 
Wow. Number, their number one hope and inspiration about their own country is diversity followed closely by freedom. So wow. think about this for a second, right? Division and diversity, two sides of the same coin, same root. They want the best of separateness without the worst of separateness. How can you be separate but not lonely? How can you be free but not lonely? How can you achieve unity without demanding uniformity? How can you stand out and be your own person but fit into something bigger than you? And that's where I'll leave it, which is, do we have a symbol where you can stand out and fit in at the same time? And I would say, yes, it was given to us. It's called the constellation. It's right there on your passport. It's right there on the dollar bill. Let's start to redevelop together the habits of interdependence and start thinking like a constellation. Matthew, thank you. And, and I will say, um, very last comment, a man named Louis Lukens, your deputy in London, says, incredible book. Uh, any, are you going to apply this to any leadership roles yourself down the road? Oh, a huge hello to Lou, the best uh, partner in diplomacy one could ever ask for. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just enjoying doing the, doing the book thing. You know, that, yeah. that's my job yeah. now. Um, yeah. And uh, if anyone has other groups that, that you think would want to engage with these topics like we have today, this is, this is what I'm doing for the foreseeable future, trying to learn from all of you guys about where this stuff resonates, where it falls short. You know, um, Eric's great question. Yeah, but how about this? That's lots of energy lives there. And so thank you sure. for your great questions. And thank you, Justin and Kat, for pulling us all together. Matt, or Matthew, excuse me. Thank you very much. And good luck with the book. And um, Wishing everyone well. Thank you for your time. You can find Matthew's book. We sent the link in the chat. Uh, and thank you very much for joining us. We'll look forward to hosting everyone next time. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Take care.